welcome back to the Cover 3 podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover three and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. Watch it. Come on over. Smash that subscribe. And also that like and jump in the chat. Come and participate. We got a great show on deck. We'll be running through the Big Ten West win totals, over, under, schedule breakdown, strengths, weaknesses, big questions, all of that and more for Wisconsin, Nebraska, Iowa, Purdue, Minnesota, Illinois, and Northwestern. If you are interested in a Big Ten East team and you missed out on Monday's episode, we'll go and check that out when we're done here now running through Ohio State with that 11 on the board. Uh, do we think that they're going to be more likely 12 and 0, 11 and 1, or will the Buckeyes trip up a couple times and go 10 and 2? All those questions, check it out on Monday's episode. Next week, we will have the SEC up on up on deck. Uh, so we will do the East and then the West. And uh, then we've got uh, Notre Dame and some group of five teams that we'll highlight. And then all of a sudden, you look around, daggum, win totals locks will be coming your way. So make sure that you're with us all the way through and during uh, the 2022 season. All right. Uh, no more housekeeping to take care of. Uh, we just want to dive in. I mean, this is, this is the Big Ten West. It's the most important episode that we're going to do throughout the entire month. So we need to dedicate our time to it. So we will get things started, as we always do with the win totals, with the general manager of Vanderbilt Football. As much as I think it's the, the under Count is a up. safe play, like I can't even. Count them up. Count them up. How many kids are going to win this fall? I can't fathom who wins. How many kids are going to win this fall? I just can't. I don't see it. It's not, it's not on there. It's, it's not, not the schedule I'm looking at. Unless there's another schedule somewhere. We begin our look at the Big Ten West with the Wisconsin Badgers. Wisconsin has an over-under win total of nine wins at the Caesar Sportsbook. Minus 115 to the over, minus 115 to the under. Favorable non-con. We got Illinois State, Washington State, New Mexico State. They are all going to be coming to Madison. The draw from the East includes a road trip to play Ohio State at Columbus. That'll be tough. Uh, at Michigan State, maybe a little less so, but still challenging. Then Maryland at home. Uh, the draw from the West, uh, Illinois, Purdue, Minnesota at home, Northwestern, Iowa, Nebraska away. Uh, a note, as I was compiling my uh, pre-show research, that reminded me what Bud Elliott said during the Big 12 show, that – you always got to look with the nine game conference schedule. Who's got the five home games? Who's got the four away games? The whole daggum West division is sitting here with only four home games and five away games. So the West division now is always going to have uh, two division games on the road, one at home. Um, you know, we already did the East division, but it's still something that I thought was interesting, particularly when we get to Nebraska and Northwestern, but more on that later. So here's what we got with the Badgers. Graham Mertz. Wow, look at what he did in the first game of 2020. Then, sorry, Tom. Then he gets COVID. Then he gets out of the lineup. And, and you just you start to see what you think could be a new Wisconsin offense. But the decision-making wasn't great in 2021. There was a little bit of a regression, at least in terms of what we thought that ceiling could be. We make a change at offensive coordinator. We got Bobby Ingram coming in. And the talk is that we're going to be opening up this Wisconsin offense. Braylon Allen at running back is, you know, one of the better running backs in the conference. The offensive line is expected to be good. Where are the pass catchers? Defense loses a ton. Do we expect Jim Leonard to be able to maintain that high standard that we've seen from Wisconsin? And most importantly, can Wisconsin uh, climb to the top of this division by the end of the season? Where are we at with the Badgers at nine wins? I'm going under. I, I think under. Yeah, I'm pretty. I mean, I think. A push is also very likely, but I don't think this is a 10 win team, at least not in the regular season. I, you mentioned Graham Mertz and his start went in 2020 in the COVID year against Illinois, where I don't think he threw an incompletion. He threw like 75 touchdowns, 500 yards. The new dawn of Wisconsin football had to come. But ever since then, it's honestly, I like Jack Cohen transferred out, you know, because Mertz took the job. And I do feel like Wisconsin has downgraded. Like, I thought Jack Cohen was a better player in this Wisconsin offense than Mertz has been since that very first game. And last year, that was, you know, still the same kind of theme for this Wisconsin team last year. And actually, we're doing the Big Ten West. It's kind of a theme for the entire division. There aren't 
many great offenses in this division, but Wisconsin was a very one-dimensional team on offense last year, and that one dimension was 17-year-old Braylon Allen, who's now 18 years old and is a very good running back. And I think that with their offensive line and with Braylon Allen, they're still going to be able to run the ball, but I don't see the explosiveness in the passing game, either from the quarterback or the receiver position. And when you look at that schedule, because as you mentioned, Chip, the West is playing the four and five part, four home games, five road games, which means that of your cross division games against the East, which is the tougher division, two of those are going to be on the road. And as you mentioned, one of those is at Ohio State for the Badgers. And that's like if you're the West team, that's the one road game you're trying to avoid every single year. When it does show up, it's your turn. You're just kind of like, damn it. So. To me, I, I look at this non-con. I think they're going to go three and zero. I don't think they're going to get much of a challenge in any of those games. Maybe Wazoo does, but I think defensively, Wisconsin's still going to be one of the best teams in the country. So I'm not too concerned about that. But I see Ohio State on the road as a loss. I see Michigan State on the road. I don't think they're going to be favored in that game. I think they could lose that one more often than not. Back-to-back road games to finish, or not to finish, but back-to-back road games late in the year at Iowa, at Nebraska. Then they get Minnesota at home to finish the year, and Minnesota has given Wisconsin trouble the last few years. So I look at this team. I don't see them getting through the regular season without at least three losses. I think four losses is very much in play. So I'm on the under for the Badgers. Yeah, Tom, I'm going to join you there. Uh, I think nine is a a good number to bet here. I I actually think this is bettable. So for me, it's it's more than just a little bit of a lean. Uh, This is also like, Shouts to Caesars for not just copying everybody else's numbers. Caesars seems committed to putting out their own numbers, and uh, they are by far the high book on Wisconsin. Everybody oh, else is everybody else is dealing eight and a half, you know, minus one forty, minus one thirty five, and Caesars is out here, hey, flat nine, mm-hmm. minus fifteen to both sides. Uh, so anyway, generally you don't want to bet over on the highest number in the market. So for that reason, you have to. I think you, if you're going to bet this, you have to take the under. Just that's kind of just common sense math. However, for some actual football reasons, since that's probably what most listeners care about, uh, I will say Graham Mertz got a lot better towards the end of last year. Part of that was probably just the opponent uh, that he that he faced on a weekly basis. But I do think he got a little bit better as he got more comfortable within the system. The front seven should be pretty good. But I think there are some teams that, in theory, could give them a little bit of trouble. The, the secondary did lose a lot. Now they get three uh, FBS transfers and they get a kid from Toledo. Uh, to come in as well, who was a 2016 signee who actually, shout out Evan Flood of our Badger site, uh, who actually played for Wisconsin's DB coach back in 2016, which means he's a seventh year player. So a little bit of veteran experience comes in. This sounds like I'm talking myself into an over, but but I assure you, (laughs) I I am not. Uh, I think that the pass catching losses they had with with, with Ferguson and the receivers are, are particularly important. I think they'll be good on the offensive line, but they lost two really good players up there. And there is some danger in assuming that Wisconsin will just reload on the offensive line all the time, but it's generally a pretty good bet. Uh, the secondary, they lost good guys, and we'll see how well they, they rebound. I do think they're probably still the favorite for this division because they finished the year with Minnesota at home, and there are not that many teams on the schedule who throw the ball well. Like Ohio State, I think we'll chuck it on them. At Michigan State is dangerous for that reason. I guess Maryland at home, if Maryland plays any defense, but I'm skeptical there. And we'll see about Nebraska and talk about them in this episode. But for me, it, it's under. I have them at 8.55. So that's almost a half win advantage here. So I see the Maryland matchup. Um, remember when we saw Maryland against Iowa? And it was like, oh, oh, when you go up against a team with a good defense and a good secondary and the mistakes start mm-hmm. piling up and they're able to you know play a little bit of keep away in ball control, offense never gets in a rhythm. I, I feel confident handing that uh, to Wisconsin. So I've got them at three in the non-con. I've got them one from the east. And then I do think that Illinois, Purdue, Minnesota, all those games being at home, those are, are going to get it to you. You give them Northwestern as well. But do you believe that Wisconsin is going to be able to go to Iowa and get that win? Mm, I, I, I lean Iowa right now. Do you believe that Wisconsin is going to go to Nebraska and get that win? Might lean Nebraska right now. I'm I'm with you guys. I'm a, I'm a push lean under on the Badgers and for the the football reasons outside of the schedule I it is all about are you trying to open this thing up without having uh the personnel in place that's ready to go to a little bit more of a you know spread uh more opened up offense the the players seem to like the you know Bobby Ingram and what they're trying to do and you know maybe it does lead to some better play from Graham Mertz and I will um to to follow up what you said but 
there were some opponents at the back half of the schedule when Wisconsin turned it around. There were wins that were good wins. You beat Iowa. You beat Purdue. You you go in, and I do think the Badgers team turned a corner in a way that we should recognize after a really, really rocky start. But I still see this as, as a situation where 10-2 and two does does not seem likely when I can look at and look and find two losses before we even look at you know how you're going to be uh, in division play. So push lean under when I'm looking at Wisconsin right now. And uh, I didn't even know the thing about the market, but yeah, don't, don't take an over when everyone else is at eight and a half and it's sitting mm-hmm. there at nine, but uh, yeah, shout out to Caesars for, for thinking for being a, Hey, you know what they are? They're independent thinkers. <laughs> they did their own research. Thought leaders. Thought leaders. Count them up. Speaking of Nebraska, we got a couple teams here that have an over under win total at seven and a half. Both juice to the over. We'll start with the Corn Huskers, minus 135 to the over at Caesar Sportsbook, plus 105 to the under. In the non conference, it's North Dakota, not state, but North Dakota, uh, Georgia Southern. Hey, Clay Helton, and Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma, remember, very close. Very interesting game a year ago in Norman. Now they get the return visit from the Sooners. That game will be in Lincoln. Draw from the East. You get Indiana and Rutgers, always favorable. But then you also have a a game in the big house against Michigan. Then we get into division play. Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin are going to be your home games. And then, interesting wrinkle here, one of their division away games is in Ireland. So it's not actually a hostile environment, though I – TBD on what we're going to uh, see in terms of the the crowd there. Uh, Northwestern, Purdue, and Iowa are the division opponents that they will play away from Lincoln. Now, we we have said goodbye to the Adrian Martinez era. Uh, we have hired Mark Whipple to come in and take over the offense. Uh, Scott Frost has indicated, at least in some of his comments, that that's led to him taking his hands off of the offense a little bit, being able to focus on other parts of the roster, uh, other parts of the team. Casey Thompson, the former Texas quarterback, shows up, and I we believe he's probably going to end up being the starting quarterback. I'm, I'm not sure if we've got other suggestions um, otherwise here, but Nebraska is in is without a doubt one of the more interesting teams in all of college football right now because there are expectations of doing something that Nebraska has not done yet at with Scott Frost, and that is make a bowl game. And not only that, but we're sitting here at seven and five. So that's not even squeaking in. That's that's being one of the better teams in the division. So Scott Frost, hot seat expectations year. I mean, get your like I'm I'm fascinated. I'm dialed in. Where are we at with the win total? The greatest three win team in history has got a win total of seven and a half. And I think that's too high. Under. Yeah. I I this team's going to be better last year record wise. I don't know if it's actually going to be better, but it's going to be hard to go three and nine if they play the same way they did last year. Because, you know, their nine losses last year were by a total of 56 points. They were pretty much, they were all one score games. Like they didn't get blown out in any of their losses. They hung tough with some tougher teams, but they routinely shot themselves in the foot. But just for context, comparison's sake, Nebraska lost nine games last year by 56 points. Northwestern lost nine games last year by 210 points. Just to give you an idea of the difference when you're losing that many games, how the typical results are of those games. So I expect that they'll be better. I think that, you know, with Adrian Martinez gone, the fingers crossed, there won't be as many turnovers. The special teams have to improve because they were just God awful last year. They've had a couple transfers in there. The coaching changes. I expect improvement. I also expect Nebraska to get off to the kind of start to the season where people are pretty high on them. Like if you look at that non-con, they're going to lose the Oklahoma game in all likelihood. But I think they'll beat North Dakota. I think they'll beat Georgia Southern. I think they'll beat Northwestern in Ireland to start the season. So they'll probably be three and one. Maybe they beat Indiana on homecoming to get to four and one. Then they go on the road and beat Rutgers. They're sitting at five and one. And then hell, who knows? Maybe they go on the road and beat Purdue. They're sitting at six and one. And then they're on their second bye. And then the pain starts because after that second bye, they get Illinois at home to start, which is winnable. That might get them to seven and one. But then they finish with Minnesota at Michigan, Wisconsin at Iowa. They're, I don't think they're going to be favored in any of those games. They'll be favored. Oh, they'll be favored at home against Minnesota. But the other ones, they'll be 
underdogs like this is a team that could start seven and one and then lose their last four games so it's like they, they'll go from really high to finishing seven and five and everybody will be really disappointed and that's if they play to the peak of their capability in the first eight games of the season so I think seven and five is what we're looking at here I think six and six is very much in play I do think Nebraska is going to get to a bowl game so finally but eight and four is not happening I think eight and four could happen uh this is not something that I'm betting. I'm at 7.7, so seven and a half with minus 135. I think Chip said juice was that like that's not that's not an edge to me, mm -hmm. but, but the under is also not an edge. So it really it's it's a pass for me at this number. Uh speaking of pass, I think Nebraska will pass the ball uh, quite a bit more this year with Mark Whipple coming with Casey Thompson, who I think with a healthier hand, you know, could show a lot of improvement. Uh, but I do have some concerns here as as well. Uh this defense was really damn good last year and kept this yeah. team in games. Like Eric Chenander did an awesome job with what had to be an extremely frustrating year for him because he had a, a he had a defense that was good enough to win the West and the offense oftentimes let them down with critical turnovers. The special teams also, as somebody who had the correct side, or well, wait, who did I have? I think I, I had Michigan State and in no way did I deserve to win that bet against Nebraska. Like Michigan State <laughs> lucked into that win 100% because Nebraska's kid – uh, punting hit like a 25 yard punt to the wrong side of the coverage and i mean tom could have could have run it in on a stationary peloton right like that, that that's that's how wide open his ass was so sorry for the cursing they do bring in a, a new kicker i think they brought in the new yeah they brought in the new punter as well i think they, they will have immediate edges there the early part of the schedule is pretty soft unless you're really high on northwestern i think they could beat oklahoma at home i think they will be less than, than a touchdown underdog uh, in norman or excuse me, uh, in, in Lincoln for that game. Georgia Southern is really pretty bad. And I, I'm i not betting the over on this team, but I, I think it's possible. And if they do, I think this will only be the second time since World War II that a team that had three wins or more from the previous year more than doubled it and probably had a worse power rating. Because I don't think this team is better than last year's team. But I think it actually really could win seven or eight games despite not being quite as good. The schedule's a little better if they get some bounces it could help. So they're sitting at 10 and a half right now as a, as a 10 and a half point favorite against Northwestern for that game in Ireland during week zero. Is that, is that about where you've got sort of their, their power rating or the, their line right there? Because I, I, no, I, I think there's still value on this. Like no, like lay it with Nebraska. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Now look, I don't love going against, I, there are certain teams because of coaching styles that I apply a point spread penalty to. Uh, in terms of betting against, like I do not oh, love, laying, I don't love laying points against against Northwestern because mm -hmm. they play so conservatively. N Narduzzi, non Whipple edition, kind of the same thing. There, there's some teams out there uh, that are better to take the points with. There are some teams that are better to take the money line with, that just for certain reasons. So I'm not like in a huge rush to slam Nebraska here, but I do think if I had to take a side in that game, I I think Nebraska is the side. So if it's played, if, if it's coached by robots in a vacuum, it, Nebraska is a 17 point favorite, but the fact yeah, probably is, 14, but yeah, 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 exactly. You can't, you can't do that with, uh, with Pat Fitzgerald, especially with the chaos that would be, by the way, comment from the chat earlier, uh, Jordan put it up on the screen, but uh, is it an act of war that we're sending Nebraska and Northwestern to go play in Ireland? I understand. I would assume that our relations with the country are, are, are decent right now, but we are certainly sending the uh, the best of the best over there right now for this for this great showcase in the Our Lingus Classic. I think it'll work to our benefit in that after watching these two play, the University of Dublin will want nothing but about joining the Big Ten. So it'll save college mm. football. This is true. You know, Northwestern staying independent and Nebraska and Northwestern playing a game of which the quality is so poor that Dublin will no longer want to join the Big Ten. Uh, this is this is the way that we keep college football as we know it together into the future. Keep it American. <laughs> How many games are going to win this fall? The Iowa Hawkeyes also have an over-under win total of seven and a half. It is minus 125 to the over, minus 105. Whoa. Yeah, minus 105 to the under. I might have that as a typo, but minus 125 to the over. South Dakota State, uh, Cyhawk, Iowa State game. That's going to be at home. Nevada also at home. Uh, the draw from the east, Rutgers away, away, Michigan at home, Ohio State away. 
not great when you got Ohio State and Michigan on there. Uh, Northwestern, Wisconsin, and Nebraska will all be coming to Kinnick Stadium, while the Hawkeyes will be hitting the road to play Illinois, Purdue, and Minnesota. There is such an incredible, incredibly consistent high floor proposition with the Hawkeyes, where you know coming off a Big Ten West Division title, you're you're looking at Iowa and you're thinking like, okay, this is a team that I think can compete once again to be the best team in the Big Ten West. But we're sitting here with a win total of seven and a half because there are very, very small margins. Iowa wins with small margins. They're very good at winning with small margins. Can they end up on the right side of those bounces again? Uh, where are we at with the Hawkeyes? I think this is a very good number. Uh, now, this came out six and a half about three months ago, and I think over six and a half was, was not a terrible play. I have some concerns, mainly nepotism related, uh, that the friends kept his son to coach the offense and moved him in to be the offensive coordinator uh, because I really have not seen any true signs of progress there at Iowa offensively. But narrative aside, there is some chance that they could improve offensively. They do bring back almost everybody who contributed to that dumpster fire last year. And so maybe just through more experience, more cohesiveness, maybe they, I don't know, go off-site for their camp and, and do some s'mores and stuff. Maybe they just play together, right? I think that's that's possible. Now, they are very experienced up front on both sides. Now, they lose Lindebaum, but I think the offensive line actually could improve even with losing him. Defensively, I think Iowa will have a better pass rush this year, and that could help to make up for the loss of, of, of some of their secondary. But I, I actually project them dead on this number, literally seven and a half. So I don't see an edge here. I think they're a contender for the conference potentially, but – uh, I had a I had a note here that their cross division is difficult, and I should have just written out the teams. Oh yeah, so they have to play uh, at Ohio State and Michigan. So that's uh, Michigan's at home, but yeah, Michigan's at home. Excuse me, Michigan at home, but they Bitch. have to go to Ohio State. That's, that's tricky. Ooh, and a sandwich spot to Illinois. Yeah, in between. Yeah, I I'm leaning over. I'm not betting it. But I, I think that this is what's interesting is, you know, you think of Wisconsin and Iowa as probably I don't know if they're the, the favorites in every book, but just the two teams with Northwestern being where it is that typically compete for the Big Ten West title. And both of them are the teams that drew Ohio State on the road. And I think that kind of makes the Big Ten West that combined with the four and five thing this year, just a very wide open division in which a whole lot of different teams can win it, which is why it's going to be fun to watch. But. I look at this Iowa team, and I think that defensively, they're still going to be solid. Offensively, they're going to be Iowa. But it it works for them. So it, the question, though, is we talked about it so much last year with, like, the turnovers that they forced on defense. And is it sustainable? Well, time has proven for Iowa that it is somewhat sustainable for them because they typically do it year after year. But while they finished last year with a turnover margin of plus 12 and their points off turnover margin of 48 was the 10th best in the country – there is some context to it as far as being worried about it being repeatable because 11 of the turnovers they forced came in two games against Iowa State and Maryland. Both were on the road. They first four at Iowa State, and then they forced the seven at Maryland on that Friday night game that was just absolutely ridiculous. And both of those games, they finished with a plus 44 points off turnover margin. So two games kind of accounted for most of that. All in all, this was still a team that forced a lot of turnovers, but also created plenty of its own. And I think that we if they can, if they force less turnovers, just based on the way Iowa typically plays, I also expect them to commit fewer turnovers. So I think that will kind of balance itself out. And in their non-con South Dakota State, that's not an easy SCS program to play, but I still think they're going to win that game. They get Nevada at home in Nevada with, I think they're going to be one of the worst teams in the country this year. So that should be an easy win. Iowa State at home, always a tough game, but Iowa's coming out on the better side of that more often than not. The road, the road schedule is not terrible. We mentioned the Ohio State game, but their other road games are Rutgers, Purdue, Minnesota. They can win those games. Mm -hmm. So outside of Ohio State, but the Purdue, the Minnesota, the Rutgers, and Illinois, those are all winnable games for Iowa. So outside that Ohio State game, the road schedule, manageable. Home schedule, Michigan at home is tough, but they also get Northwestern at home. I think getting both Wisconsin and Nebraska at home is huge for the division race because those will be key games. And I do think that the Big Ten did a good job of backloading all the big Big Ten West games in November because kind of like we talked about with uh, Wisconsin, Iowa's schedule finishes with games against Purdue, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Nebraska, who are probably going to be their, you know, primary contenders in the divisions. But 
I think this is an eight and four team slightly more often than a seven and five team. So I'm going over, but like I said at the top, I'm probably not betting it. But just the way things break down for me, I don't think there's going to be a 10-win team in the West. I, I do think Iowa's going to get eight, though. We had a discussion on the group chat maybe a week or so ago about Big Ten quarterbacks. And the idea that, like, yeah, there's not a lot of names that are flashing at the top of NFL draft boards. There's not a lot of um, players that you're necessarily – um, you know, jazzed about when it comes to trying to rank all the quarterbacks in the entire country. But from a blanket perspective, you do have a lot of schools that at least feel comfortable with who they have at quarterback running the offense. They feel like they've got a known quantity. I say that because Iowa has the best secondary in the Big Ten. And I think that that becomes a real strength when you think about uh, having to go play against Tanner Morgan who's back with Kirk Sharaka? more on that later, when it has to do with going up against Aiden O'Connell. If Graham Mertz is going to open, if Wisconsin's going to open this thing up with Graham Mertz, if Casey Thompson, as Bud said, is going to be throwing the ball a lot more than Nebraska did um, than Nebraska did a year ago. And then, of course, J.J. McCarthy, Cade McNamara, whoever it ends up being at Michigan. Like, all of these quarterbacks that I was going to have to face, I think the defense, led by my guy, Phil Parker, drafted to uh, my coaching staff, that I think that they get uh, a real advantage out of. What am I going to get out of Spencer Petras? I don't know, man. I, I, I've I, the criticizing or at least uh, you know providing the analysis for the coaching and the way the offense is constructed, the way they handle their business is very fair. It also might be that they're sitting there in practice and they're like, I, I don't know what we do with this guy. Like he's he's got these physical tools. He has shown us this, this, and this. But man, there is just not enough consistency there for us to be able to trust him. We'll we'll see. Uh, as he at least like he does not fall into that um, coaching staff feels comfortable about their quarterback situation. If I had to rank the quarterbacks in the Big Ten, he would not be ahead of some of those names I just mentioned. All that said, with the defense, with the secondary in particular, I've got this thing at eight and four. I'm going over on Iowa. I would like to see Iowa. Like let, let, let's have a slogan, guys. Let's march to double digits. No more of ranking 117th in passing success rate nationally. No more. <laughs> 102nd in passing efficiency. Get right? to 99. I want to see you in double digits. Give me a 99. We should put that on a shirt, right? Red, red zone roulette. The, the mark, like march through the corn, break out to the 99s, right? Like let's get, let's go. If you dude, get there, the 99 is over. 99. Um. So over. How about this one? Uh, from the chat and Mark over under 15 passing touchdowns for Iowa on the regular season. A excellent be- stat from David Eicholt. From October 2nd through the bowl game, Iowa only threw two passing touchdowns. What? Yeah. I think, yeah, I listened to, to the uh, the summer school episode we did uh, last night. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. It was like October 2nd up until the bowl game, they only threw two two passing touchdowns. Yeah, they don't, I, I get the sense that they don't trust Spencer Petrus's arm in those tight windows very much. Yeah. Talk all about these context clues. And they won 10 games last year. Mm-hmm. No, once they get inside the 10, which there usually are because there aren't a ton of explosive plays that they score from outside the 20, they're usually handing that thing off and trying to pound it. So under is the yeah, answer for sure. passing touchdowns. Mm-hmm. I do think they should throw a little bit more, though. Like, I know that sounds crazy because I don't really believe in Spencer Peters. However, uh, teams knew when Tyler Goodson was going to run. They really did. Like, if, if you look at his early down success rate, Mm-hmm. It was horrendous. Mm-hmm. Teams were basically like daring them to throw the ball. And he actually, I think it was on first and 10 inside the red zone, had a success rate under 30%. So Iowa was essentially giving away first down when it got into the red zone by just trying to slam the ball with Goodson. And that's not saying, I think Goodson's a good back. So do I, I. I will have a good offensive line. But if everybody knows what's coming, it is a little bit easier to stop. So th- play action, perhaps. Yeah. I think I think Goodson stayed on that subject. I think he's somebody who, once he gets to the NFL, is going to actually be a pretty good player and surprise a lot of people based on the numbers he put up in college just because like he's facing eight, nine-man boxes on damn near every snap. There's nowhere for him to go. He can catch two times. Mm-hmm. They, 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 they targeted him 45 times last year. Where is he now? I can't remember who drafted him. Tyler Goodson for the Green Bay Packers. There we go. Yeah, so he's going to catch like He's going to score at least three touchdowns against the Bears this year. <laughs> we document that Bears defense was good. Did, didn't we get a little report on that Bears? Defense? Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I mean, the Bears defense is tough. Snorting emoji, but 
doesn't matter against the Packers. Built different too. Built different. Just they are him. Okay. There we go. Coming up on the other side, we turn our attention to the rest of the Big Ten West. Purdue, Minnesota, Illinois, Northwestern. Is there a division title contender from that group? We'll get into that and more next. Moving on to the Purdue Boilermakers. Uh, I mentioned Aiden O'Connell. Yes, he is back, but we do lose some pretty significant pieces on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. Um, David Bell is gone. George Karloftis is gone. But there's still a, a Boilermakers program and a team that is operating with a little bit of buzz. The over-under win total is at 7, uh, minus 140 to the over, plus 110 to the under. The non-conference includes Indiana State at Syracuse and FAU. The East Division draw, their road games are Maryland and Indiana. Eh, that's, a, that's favorable. Penn State at home is obviously going to be very tough. Uh, in division play, Nebraska, Iowa, Northwestern, those are your opponents that you're going to be playing at home in West Lafayette. You will be on the road to play Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. So with the round seven juice to the over, what are the expectations and what are we doing with the win total for Purdue? I'm going under. And this is possibly a bet. I'm just not nearly as high on Purdue as a lot of other people are. Now, the one thing I think Purdue has going for it is it is truly the one team in this division that's different from everybody else. It's like when you look at the other six teams, there's a whole lot of complimentary football, run the ball, don't do anything stupid, punt from your opponent's 40-yard line and just play the field position game that goes on. Whereas Purdue tends to drop back and air it out a whole lot more than you typically see in the Big Ten West and hell in the Big Ten in general outside of Ohio State. And I think that plays to their advantage. And I think it played to their advantage last year because there's been somewhat of a trend with Jeff Brom's team since he came to Purdue. The offense is the offense. That's pretty much to be expected with Jeff Brom. But when their defense is good, Purdue is good. When their defense is bad, they tend to be pretty bad. And I look at this defense from and see what it lost last year. And I don't know for certain, I don't have a ton of confidence in what they have back that they're going to be able to get the kind of defensive production that they had last season. And if that falls off, I don't think they're going to be, you know, going four and eight or anything. But I think six and six is a lot more likely than an eight and four. And I think seven and five is more likely than an eight and four. So I look at this team and I look at the under. But that said, play devil's advocate, advocate to my own argument. As far as the West schedules are considered, this is one of the better draws. Like, you get Penn State, but you get them at home. Your two road games are Maryland and your annual rivalry game against Indiana to finish the season. The rest of the road slate, not terrible. But I think Syracuse on the road in non-con early in the season, that to me is not going to be an easy game for Purdue. I don't just trust them to go up to the formerly known as the Carrier Dome and beat the Orange. Uh, Minnesota on the road is tough. Maryland, I mentioned on the road, won't be easy. Wisconsin's on the road. I have a difficult time seeing them go to Madison and winning. Illinois on the road. They lost Illinois at home last year. They could lose to him again on the road. It's just, I don't see easy wins for this team. And also, you know, on offense, they have to replace a whole lot too. And I like Aiden O'Connell, but David Bell was very much a security blanket and he's gone. And you you lost Rondale more the year before. And I don't really know for certain who the replacements are that are going to just step in and give you the kind of production and reliability that the players they lost did. So I could look like a moron by the time this season ends and Purdue could be the same team we saw last year. It could win eight games. It could contend for a division title. But based on what I do know, I just have a hard time seeing it. So I'm under. Um, we may look like morons together. And I'm okay with that, man. We'll be sipping margaritas because the season will be over and I'm confident we're going to win a lot more than we lose like we usually do. Uh, I'm also with you on the under. Now, look, I told you guys, if you want to bet something, take the under at Wisconsin at Caesars. The under at Caesars on Purdue is not the number to take. There's seven flat, right? At plus 110, mm -hmm. there's plenty of under seven and a half minus 135. Paying 45 cents for a half win is absolutely a steal. So if you're going to bet this, find a seven and a half at a reasonable juice number. Okay, now to actual football reasons. They lost 213 targets because Bell has yes. gone to the NFL and right uh, – can we use the term flunked out or is not eligible for this year or wh whatever you want to go with, but he's not playing. So that's a well, pretty they big... went and got a former Mr. Indiana player of the year from Iowa who had to get up out of Iowa because he was like, well, I'm not going to catch any balls here. So I'm going to go to the one team in the division that throws the ball a lot. His name's Tyrone Tracy. 
Okay. Agreed. Now look, one thing that really scares me, and I look for things, are they repeatable from year to year? Iowa was a top 10 offense last year, or excuse me, Purdue was a top 10 offense last year when behind the chains. Mm-hmm. Now look, I think Jeff Brom is an excellent offensive coach. I really do. I think Aiden O'Connell's probably pretty good. Their pass pro, I think, got better at times last year, but they also had some offensive line injuries. So maybe that's all repeatable. But a lot of that too is receivers making plays. And I, here's where I think Bell and Wright really hurt you when you get behind the chains. The other thing is that for most of the year, that defense actually carried that team. Mm-hmm. And I'm a little skeptical about how good it really was. I think they caught some teams at the right time to catch those teams, sort of like how I feel South Carolina. You know, I think South Carolina caught Florida at the right time last year. I, I think they caught North Carolina in that bowl game at the right time. I don't really trust my numbers on how good this Purdue defense was last year. And look, they also lose Carl Loftus, who was a big deal. I have some injury concerns in their secondary. I, I'm under here, and I also think that, truly, guys, all six road games, they will not be underdogs in, but all six road games are absolutely losable. So I, I'm i at 6.7. Over. I think that uh, while production will be boosted when you are playing on a defensive line opposite George Karloftis, because other teams are going to slant so much of their protection towards taking care of this incredible pass rush talent that you're going to be able to get some more numbers. But I do think the rest of that defensive line – in terms of quality, still pretty good. I think that the defensive front is still going to be pretty good. And I think that um, when you look at what we have offensively with Aiden O'Connell, that it's not going to be uh, as productive, but you still have the opportunity within this offense to to, to be successful. I, I look at the win against uh you go win against Indiana State. You go win at Syracuse. I agree. It's going to be tough. Uh, you go win against FAU. Maryland and Indiana, like you mentioned, Tom, that's very, very favorable. And then when I'm, I'm starting to add up the rest of it, I think that this Purdue team can go to Minnesota. It's not an automatic win, but I do think that that's winnable. Illinois, I think that's a win. Northwestern at home, a win. Can you beat Nebraska or Iowa? I think that they could get one of those two. It is, I keep coming to seven and five. But if I have to go over or under, I think eight and four is more likely than six and six is for the Boilermakers. I, another thing too, just I I don't think that's impossible. I just I I maybe I'm too close to the situation to see that, but I, I just don't see it happening for them. But going back to my concerns and something you mentioned too, Bud, you mentioned how they were how great they were behind the chains. Do you know why they were behind the chains so often? Because they that can't run the ball. Fine. Damn. They cannot run the ball to save their lives. Last year in rush EPA per play, they ranked 124th. Their explosiveness on rushing. Are you ready for this? The national average was 10%. Purdue was at 3.3%, the 130th dead last in the country. Mississippi State was at 4.8%. They were the next worst. It's like when you can't run the ball, it's hard to just rely on Aiden O'Connell, who I like him, but he's not some sort of five-star NFL sure thing QB to just drop back on every single snap when the opposing defenses, especially the defenses in this division, can just pin their ears and come after you and get you. It's going to be hard for it to work out. So it's just, that's a huge concern for me as well. Depth I also is, think, oh, go sorry, ahead. Jim, go ahead. I was going to say depth along the offensive line is very thin. Like mm-hmm. I, which they... Factor that into your expectations. I will say that while I'm sitting here with a push to an over as my official call on the podcast, I realize we are like one or two rolled up on legs at the bottom of the pile from things becoming very, very stressful for Aiden O'Connell in passing situations. This is a team like don't take this the wrong way, Purdue fans. I'm not trying to say that I think you will win three games. But if we had like betting exchanges here in, in, in the US where you could offer bets and, and like like they do in Europe or Australia where you know people can take them, I would be seeding the market with like under four and a half at some crazy odds. People would look at the over four and a half as crazy money. I, I think if you look at sort of the tail ends of the distribution that you model, th- there are situations where the bottom just drops out on this team and that mm-hmm. they finish last in the West. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like if you just try to like Sometimes when you do this, you try to factor in just like a chaos element. Like what happens if just crazy, unexpected things happen? What if O'Connell gets hurt? Yeah. And I look at like injury luck. Yeah. Injury luck and chaos kind of stuff. It's like if that stuff hits, Purdue's chances of being a lot worse are higher than of being, you know, the chaos going in their favor, just based on the way things are constructed. 
very, very, uh, very thin line for Jeff Brom. Also, they're folding in a bunch of uh, new assistants onto the staff. So it, it, is that a boost or is, is that going to have some hiccups? We will see. Count them up! The Minnesota Golden Gophers, uh, just wild season last year with low lows. You know, they they lose to Bowling Green and everyone basically writes them off. And it's like, oh, well, this team isn't going to be good. But then the Golden Gophers show up at the end of the season in late November, and they are in the mix for the division title somehow. Uh, great turnaround by PJ Flex Group. They, they bring back Tanner Morgan for, I believe, in an 11th season. Uh, here, you know, he's a sixth year quarterback actually. And he's reunited with Kirk Sharaka. That OC QB combo led to the 2019 season that included double digit wins, really the breakthrough moment for Fleck at Minnesota. Take a look at the schedule. They get New Mexico state, Western Illinois, Colorado, the, all those games at home in the non-con things a little bit more difficult. When you look at the East division draw, they have to go to Michigan state. They have to go to Penn state, but they do get Rutgers at home. In division play, Purdue, Northwestern, Iowa, all those games are going to be at home. Meanwhile, you've got to hit the road to play Illinois, Nebraska, or Wisconsin. When I was uh, trying to come up with fun, bold predictions back in May when we were sitting 100 days out from the start of college football, I, I did the minute bold prediction, Minnesota can win the Big Ten West. And you detail the return of Kirk Sharaka, uh, how Tanner Morgan played his best football under him and what that could look like. The fact that you do still have pieces in the passing game for Morgan to throw to that are impressive. And you look at Minnesota's performance last year and think that the general foundation and fabric of this, of this team is good. Yet, I look at the schedule here in early August, and I'm like, yikes, it's going to be tough to be able to find enough wins in conference play to be able to contend for a division title. So I've, I've cooled significantly, but I'm curious if that is the same for you all as we look at it. Over under seven wins, what are we doing with the Gophers? Wait, seven or seven and a half? Seven, minus 130 to the over, plus 100 to the under. Oh, I had it at seven and a half. Oh. Yeah, if it's if it's if it's seven, I'm gonna like have an internet outage real quick as I go and make some calls and bet <laughs> bet the hell out of this, and we'll, we'll resume the pod in a couple. Of- <laughs> I, I, I pulled them on um, Monday, so they, if they're sitting at seven and a half at Caesars right now, that's a recent move. Okay, uh, over for me. Um, so a couple things to like. First of all, the biggest thing that I like about this team is that Mike Sanford is no longer their offensive coordinator. Yes, uh, I, I think every every time he leaves a place, I, I'm very encouraged about what their offense will look like when he leaves. Now, I think getting back Kirk Sharaka is also a pretty big help. He meshed with Tanner Morgan well. Now, granted, they had some NFL receivers on that team, which made it a little bit easier uh, back in 2019. Was yeah, it or 2020? 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I I think that that's a positive change. The offensive line does lose a lot, but I think they've done a decent job of offensive line development there. Chip mentioned they have all their weapons back now. I think they're really well coordinated on defense. They don't make mistakes. We, we always give all this credit to Iowa, how they don't make mistakes and they do. And that's kind of how you have to run uh, really simple coverages and not run too many of them. Uh, Ohio state tried to do it last year, except they also made mistakes and that didn't work out too well for them. But Minnesota doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. They do a really good job of playing assignment sound football. They limit explosive plays like with the best of them, especially with all this, the experience they have coming back. In the secondary, uh, now they do not play. They don't have to play Ohio State, and they don't have to play Michigan. So while they do have some tough roadies, I think all five road games are losable. That's at Michigan State, at Illinois, at P- Penn State, at Nebraska, at Wisconsin. I do think they have a chance in all of those games. No Ohio State or Michigan is a big deal if you believe those are the top two teams in the East. Because if you have Ohio State, it's kind of close to an auto loss if you're a West Division team, and so avoiding them is a big deal for me. I. I, I'm, I'm over on this, guys. I'm not betting it, but I'm slightly under. I just I, I agree with you for all the reasons to be optimistic. I think Mike Sanford leading is only going to be good things for Minnesota because I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but we mentioned it. I've mentioned it many, many times. Outside of like the service academies, nobody ran the ball more often last year than Minnesota. And it was just it was maddening. But I so I think we're going to see more balance on offense. I think defensively, like this is a team that was very good on the defensive side of the ball last year. When you think of the division, Wisconsin and Iowa are the elite defenses, but Minnesota was a top 25, top 20-ish defense in a lot of the same key metrics. And it was, you know, 
some of that was this style of play because the defense was never on the field because the offense was running the ball 70 percent of the time but still when they were on the field they performed well and i think that that's probably going to continue it's just they also lose a couple of key guys from that defense and i wonder if we might see a certain like a slip up in what they're doing as far as being able to pressure the opposing quarterback because they were very good at that last year and it's one of the same similar concerns i have with purdue losing Loftus, but the schedule is beneficial. I think that when you look at the non-con, they should be 3-0. and Like New Mexico State win, Western Illinois win, Colorado, that should be a win. I think they can get the win against Purdue to start off 4-1 and after maybe probably going on the road and losing at Michigan State before they're by. And they do get the beneficial Eastern draw in that, yeah, you get, you're avoiding Ohio State and Michigan and you're getting Penn State and Michigan State instead, which is better than those two. But I would also like if one of them was at home. Like having to play both those games on the road is kind of like uh, that. That's kind of some bad luck because you get Rutgers at home. And I feel like Minnesota could go on the road and beat Rutgers. So to get him at home kind of wastes a home game for him, if that makes sense. And then the rest of the division schedule, like Purdue at home, I think they should win at Illinois on the road. They can win, but that's somewhat of a coin flip. You know, Illinois did beat Minnesota in Minneapolis last season at Nebraska is going to be kind of a coin flip. Northwestern at home should be a win. Iowa at home, Minnesota slightly favored, but coin flippish at Wisconsin. They'll be dogs, but not huge dogs. So coin flippish. There's a little, little too many coin flips for me to feel super confident about this team going eight and four. But I do think both seven and five, eight and four are the sweet spot, which is my numbers say slightly under, but I'm not going to be betting it. Yeah, I got four losses real quick. Um, and they're all four road games right there. When you take a look at the the Michigan State, the Penn State, the Nebraska, and the Wisconsin. And if I can get to four losses and see other losable games on the schedule, you mentioned the Illinois. Uh, you mentioned uh, the fact that Iowa at home is not going to be easy. Purdue at home, that's a game that's losable. I I just think that if, I, if I'm dropping them to eight and four right off the bat, then – I can't expect every single break to go Minnesota's way. So it is a probably a push, but I'm a, I'm a push lean under. Oh, at seven and a half, I got to choose a side under. Yeah, I don't think that eight wins is going to be in the mix here. Uh, again, I just I think that there are too many spots where Minnesota, a team who is probably again, based on all the hype, based on all the pieces and, and the narratives around this team, I thought that they were going to be better. Than when I really sat down and started sketching this thing out, because I, I think that they are, are going to find that they would find themselves. All right, let me test it against the number guys. They would find themselves on a neutral field as an underdog, probably of a field goal or more against Iowa and Nebraska and Wisconsin. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then probably about the same as Purdue. And then as a favorite against Northwestern and Illinois. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was a lot more middling than I was expecting. And so that, that means there's going to be a lot of toss-ups. I don't think you're going to win all your toss-ups. Seven and five is where I've got this. So for the new number of seven and a half, that has me going under. How many games are going to win this fall? Twelve for <laughs> Illinois, which is why it's preposterous that the Caesars Sportsbook has four and a half as the win total, minus 130 to the over, plus 100 to the under. Uh, The non-con, Wyoming in week zero, uh, Virginia and Chattanooga. The East Division draw, you're going to Indiana, to Michigan, hosting Michigan State. When you get into division play, it's Iowa, Minnesota, and Purdue at home, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Northwestern away. We are going to have, I've heard, and we can get the expertise in a little bit. We I've heard we're going to have a little bit of a, a different look to Illinois offensively, uh, but I expect that we're still going to see Chase Brown be one of the one of the better running backs uh, in this division, maybe even in the Big Ten as a whole. So, Tom, lead us off here. What are we doing with Illinois at four and a half? Last year, the win total for Illinois was posted at three and a half. I told you on this podcast, you all followed to go over. They finished five and seven. They probably could have gone six and six if they made some smarter decisions. This year, the win total only improves by one. And I understand it because they do lose a lot off of last year, particularly the defensive side of the ball. I have some concerns about the depth up front on the defensive line. I do have some concerns about a young, inexperienced offensive line. But you mentioned, Chip, 
there is a change in the offense. Like when Brett Bielema took the job before last season, he said that, you know, it wasn't going to be the same kind of offense you saw when he was at Wisconsin. Like they were going to modernize things. There's going to be a lot more RPO and that kind of stuff thrown in more, you know, traditional what college football looks like now. And then some, suddenly they come out against Penn State and they're running like 14 personnel because they just didn't really have it. And Bielema, after one year, fired the offensive coordinator that he hired in his first year coming back to Illinois, which typically says, you know, I'm not really happy with what we were doing on offense and brings in Barry Luddy, who was the UTSA offensive coordinator last year and who Bielema knew from his time at Arkansas and had a front row seat to watching his offense beat Illinois in Champaign last year. So this Illinois offense isn't going to be the team that's running the ball, you know, 65% of the time and just playing a whole bunch of multiple tight end sets and handing off repeatedly. We're going to see them run the ball more often, but there's going to be a lot more passing involved. I think Tommy DeVito transferring in from Syracuse is an upgrade on what they had at the quarterback position last year between Brad and Peters and Art Sitkowski. Art Sitkowski is still there as a backup. And defensively, Ryan Walters, I've mentioned this before, I think he's one of the best defensive coordinators in the country right now. I think that it's only a matter of time before he is either a head coach somewhere or he is poached by like a playoff contending kind of defense, somebody to, you know, upgrade to replace their guy because he does some very interesting stuff. He completely overhauled this defense in the middle of the season last year, and they went from being very bad early in the year to being one of the best defenses in the country for the rest of the season from that point on. And I think we're going to see that kind of continue where the defense is still going to be solid. I think they're still going to be able to run the ball. And I think they'll finally be able to add a little bit more of a passing attack to it and some explosiveness in the passing game. And then you get to the schedule. Wyoming was a good team last year, but pretty much everybody on that team that mattered transferred a lot of them to Utah State. So I think that's going to be a win. At Indiana in week two on a Friday night, short week, I lean Indiana there. That's kind of a tough turnaround and on six days, and it's Indiana's opener, so they've been preparing for Illinois the entire time. But I think Virginia this year, they got crushed by Virginia last year on the road, and that was the game that kind of you know, was the spark for the change on defense that changed things. I think they can get Virginia at home this year because I don't know what the Cavs are going to look like. Chattanooga game, that'll be a win. So th- I can see them going 3-0 and in non-con and go- starting off 3-1. and Wisconsin, that's probably going to be a loss. Yeah. Iowa at home, probably going to be a loss. Just yeah. it's hard to expect Illinois is going to win those games. Minnesota at home, as I mentioned, they beat Minnesota in Minneapolis last year. I think they could beat – it's a coin flip. They could beat Minnesota at home this year. At Nebraska, I believe we've won two straight against Nebraska. It's on the road, tough, but Illinois won the last time it was on the road at Lincoln, so that's not out of line. Michigan State, Illinois had success against Michigan State recent years, too. Whether that'll be the case again, I don't know. Purdue, I've already mentioned I'm kind of down on them. At Michigan on the road, that's a loss. At Northwestern, I think that's probably a win. I could see this. I think this team's getting to five wins. It could get to six. So I'm pretty comfortably on the over here. Yeah, I'm not quite as comfortable on the over as Tom is. Uh, receiver scares me a little bit. I, I feel like they need more playmakers than than just Isaiah. Uh, but I tend to like this team, even though they did lose a lot. I think Bielema has done an okay job in the transfer portal. I think he's tr- sort of starting to mold his team in his image. I I generally trust his staff to to produce a, a quality offensive line, usually. Like, that's kind of one of his specialties. Defensive line depth agree with Tom. It scares me. I think Tom hit, hit the real key point here. Uh, I I think there is not a 50% chance, but it's probably a 40% chance that they can go 3-0 and in the non-conference. And if you're 3-0 and in the non-conference, then it, it sort of opens up some things for you with this because you only need to pluck off two wins. Now, Northwestern's one of them, right? So when you're doing the yeah, math... You have to like- think that they have a shot. I mean, like I don't... Th- Northwestern to me is not a lock. I don't think Illinois is good enough to address any Big Ten team as a lock win, especially not on the road. Mm -hmm. But the other thing they do is they don't have to play Ohio State. So I like that. And then the two best teams they play on their schedule are road games, Michigan and Wisconsin. Now, normally, that's not a good thing. You don't want to play good teams on the road if you're a good team. But if you're a bad team or just a whatever team trying to make a bowl, you'd rather have those very difficult opponents on the road because you're going to lose to them on the road, at home, on the moon, you know, <laughs> under the under the sea, it doesn't really matter. Like you're you're going to lose to Michigan, you're going to lose to Wisconsin, right? Yeah. So <laughs> take those L's on the road, and in turn, get more winnable games at home. I mean, their home schedule: Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan State, Purdue. I think they can get one of those games. 
you know it's better down where it's wetter <laughs> under the sea um yeah over i that's i i, I spoiled it i'm sorry but yeah i've got the three and oh in the non-conference and, and i will give you northwestern and i just need you to get one and this illinois team has shown over the last couple of years whether it's michigan state a couple of years ago like you mentioned whether it's penn state last year like illinois will get up and get one they'll go in they'll go and beat somebody that they are an underdog against in conference play i think that you i circle the minnesota purdue uh those two games at home as a potential opportunity there you mentioned the Nebraska game, the Michigan State game at home, and then, heck, it might just be Indiana. And if they go and win on a Friday night in Bloomington, then we're already sitting on where we need to be if they can go 3-0 and in non-con Indiana Northwestern. It's very much uh, realistic for Illinois. I am also on the over. I Six would be something. That takes that takes two go up and get them wins and uh, and that would be a great step forward for Brett Bielma but I feel confident feeling looking at five and seven and thinking that is realistic. Count them up. Bringing things home with the Northwestern Wildcats over under win total at Caesar Sportsbook of three and a half. Uh, minus 140 to the over, plus 110 to the under. The non-conference play includes Duke, Southern Illinois, and Miami, Ohio. Uh, the East Division at Penn State, at Maryland, Ohio State at home. Yikes. I mean, I guess all of it's a little bit tough when you're looking at Northwestern from the, the, the bottom of the conference and looking up. I mentioned the Northwestern Nebraska you know, wrinkle in terms of the home away splits and division play. This is a Northwestern home game in terms of the rotation, but it's in Ireland. So there are only two division home games for Northwestern, and one of them is against Illinois. The other is against Wisconsin. The Wildcats will be on the road for Iowa, Minnesota, and Purdue. Three and a half wins. What do we see for the Wildcats? <laughs> Under. Yeah, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, Chip, go first. and I'm, I'm, I have a hard time with this team. I am not comfortable. Um, so Duke won a close game at the beginning last year. That game was in Durham. I think that especially where it is in the in the schedule, you know, very beginning of the Mike Elko era, sort of feeling things out. I I think Nebraska uh, Northwestern probably wins that one, but not necessarily guaranteed. Miami, Ohio, yeah, that's that's probably a win too, but. That's why it's, I'm so focused on the non con. I mean, listen, it, I am focused on the non con because they need to go three and oh to have any shot of being able to, in my analysis, they need to go three and oh in the non conference play to be able to hit four wins and hit this over. And if I've got a couple spots, even in the non conference, where I'm a little bit shaky, I think that they're probably 0 and three against the East Division, Penn State at, at Penn State at Maryland, Ohio State, loss, loss, loss. Uh, they, I mentioned earlier, they are 10 point underdogs to Nebraska. Uh, in that opener in week zero, I just told you I'm giving Illinois the win at the end of the season. Do I think that Northwestern's ready to go to Iowa, to Minnesota, or to Purdue? This is where I come back to something I've mentioned before. That game is so important to Minnesota and Purdue in terms of accomplishing what they need to do. There will be no overlooking the Wildcats. And so I I look at this and um, there's – yeah, it, the fact that I pause – when I consider whether or not Northwestern can go three and zero in non-conference play, and where I've got Northwestern rated compared to the rest of the Big Ten, I'm going under for three and a half. I'm not betting this because I feel like there's a there's a weird thing going on here. So the last two full seasons we had, right, non-COVID edition, Northwestern had by far the worst offense in the Power Five. Mm -hmm. Okay, like it, it was just really unwatchable. I don't think Ryan Holinsky can play. So that's another negative that that I would have. They lost like almost everybody except for their one stud on the defensive line. I still have no idea if if the uh, if um, was it Jim O'Neill they, that that they replaced their their longtime uh, defensive coordinator with, and Brandon Joseph kind of ripped him on his way out in transferring to Notre Dame. By the way, Brandon Joseph is not there anymore. He's a pretty good safety who transferred to the Irish. But the number here is very low. Uh, I think Miami Ohio could beat them. If you play Ryan Holinsky, anybody can beat you, honestly. Like, that's not saying they will, like, Duke will beat them, but in, any game is losable with some of the turnovers he makes. I, the bottom could completely fall out of this team. Like, maybe they're not in all like the rah rah stuff anymore. But also, Narduzzi typically 
or Narduzzi, good lord. Uh, <laughs> Fitz typically does a pretty good job of getting his team together to rally defensively, and I have a hard time seeing Northwestern be that damn bad again yeah. defensively. So I'm not rushing to bet this. I think they will limit explosive plays that much better on the on the back end than they did last year. If you do that, that'll keep you in some games. Uh, for the show purposes, I'm taking the under, but it's not something that I'm betting. Yeah, I'm in pretty much the same place. I'm taking the under for the show. I'm not betting it. I do think that this, kind of like you were saying, Chip, this kind of just becomes a case of, do you think they'll win a Big Ten game? Because I, I do think there's a very good shot that they go 3-0 and in non-conference. Although, I don't think Duke and Miami of Ohio are gimmies by any stretch. They could lose either one of those games, depending on how the offense plays. But the defense, I'm with you, bud. Like they can't be as bad as they were last year. It's just that was the one thing of Northwestern last season that kind of was a head scratch because even, you know, Mike Hankwitz left, Jim O'Neill comes in, takes over the role. But even if you expect there to be some kind of drop off defensively, the drop off that came was just not something that I think is the new the new normal i think it's just like huh what the hell happened there kind of like the chaos thing we were talking about when it came to purdue earlier the chaos hit the northwestern defense the offense did them no favors and they were never able to recover but that offense is still not anything i could put a ton of faith in like if you look where they ranked last year and every single key stat they're typically somewhere between 110 and 127 which is awful which is probably still one of the worst in the power five and I don't know what's there. Like they they actually were pretty decent running the ball as far as getting big plays in the ground game. They were able to pop them sometimes, but it's, it's hard to rely on explosive run plays when you don't have a passing attack that opposing defenses need to give a damn about. And I don't know if Northwestern has that yet. And m does do. it. <laughs> well, a <A&M> also <laughs> has NFL offensive line. Yeah, no, I'm and <laughs> Northwestern has one. They've got a left tackle that will probably be a top 15 pick at worst in the NFL draft next year. But the other four guys aren't NFL guys. So I, I, it's Northwestern. They could do anything, especially in a year like this one where I've talked about, I think the West is wide open for the most part. They could surprise a lot of people. They could get to a bowl game. They might even win seven games. Who the hell knows? You, what? Never, really, you <laughs> never know what you can't like Northwestern is a chaos team. Like yeah. it's not exciting chaos, but it's chaos. You don't really know what to expect. So I'm taking the under for the show, but this is a team that I wouldn't be surprised at all if they get to four and eight or five and seven. Um, one other key stat Tom mentioned, they were sort of like in that one fifteen range. Two stats that they were actually dead last in the country. Touchdown conversion once they were goal to go. Mm-hmm. Also, expected points and field goals. So not only were they the worst team at actually scoring touchdowns once they got inside the 10, they were also the worst field goal kicking team in the country. That's not really the best combo. You know, when, when, yeah, they were... Uh, let's find it here. Yeah, so they were... Uh, on field goals between, uh, well, under forty-five yards, they were they were six of thirteen, and Northwestern generally kicks a lot of field goals because they play a lot of very close games because they don't blow anybody out because they play well they don't play quite as slow as they, as they once did but that's a bad call. Oh, they're, they don't like they're, scoring. That's a bad combo. Let's. Yeah. I mean, listen. Like, I you can tell the the expected points added. We can talk about the success rate. How about the fact that they didn't even average seventeen points a game yeah. in football as a Power Five team across an entire season, averaging less than seventeen points per game? Yeah, to, to put some numbers to that that goal to go stat, just for context, like the national average for teams last year in goal to go situations was they scored a touchdown seventy five point three percent of the time. Northwestern scored a touchdown 52% of the time. So just over half. You got them in a goal to go. They were scored a touchdown. That's that's okay. Coin flip. You know, we, <laughs> we talk about red zone roulette. If you're playing Northwestern, it's just a coin flip, man. That's, that's if you're where playing red zone roulette, you have the wheel magnetized. <laughs> right? Like against Northwestern, it, it, it's like uh, whatever movie that was. But that's where the Clayton Thorson QB sneak on the goal line just, you really miss that if you're Northwestern because he was a lead at it. Yeah. That's absolutely true. 
We will be back with more win totals next week. But first, on Thursday, we will dive back into the big old bag of mail. A reminder, if you would like to add your question to the big old bag of mail, you can do it by leaving us a five-star review. And in that review, put your question for the mailbag. You can also reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, remember, you can follow him on Twitter at, at Tom Fernelli, him at Bud Elliott 3 me at Chip underscore Patterson. Then next week, the SEC East on Monday, the SEC West on Wednesday. And then we will bring in Notre Dame, some group of five teams to the conversation, and then we will be at our win totals locks. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.